Um, the word transformation we know um, and would have given you already the idea of change and of growth. And that's really the point that we want to be able to see as we look at the subject uh, of this man, the, perhaps the greatest of the followers of our Lord Jesus Christ, is that transformation. <clears throat> if you um, haven't anything else to write on your card that's got to go up on the wall, um, then maybe it's this, that the Acts 7 Saul is a long way away from the Acts 9 Saul and it's even further to the second of Timothy chapter 4 Paul and what we hope to see brothers and sisters over the five studies that we uh, are going to have a look at um, over this period and, and there's their subjects up on the title up on the screen uh, is to understand the distance and the difference between what Saul was when we are first introduced to him here in Acts chapter 7, what he was able to become and how that happened. And hopefully able to therefore assign some of those lessons to ourselves and recognise the level of growth and the transformation that God can work in our own lives. And we hope to be able to marvel anew at the wonder of God's grace and to consider how that can transform ourselves. Now you will have noticed here that I have alliterated all of the subjects. Um, although the first one my children tell me doesn't really work because it's pronounced pff. So we could say Pharisee to try and make them all, all sort of rhyme here. But it was Pharisee, persecutor, preacher, parent, prisoner. Um, I wanted apostle in there. Um, as in the Apostle Paul, but um, the, again, the, the boys told me that wouldn't work, so we went with preacher instead, so that will be the subject that we will consider on that occasion. But tonight we want to have a look at, at Pharisee, we want to look at the background of the sort of person that Paul was, or that Saul was, uh, at the point that we read of him here in Acts chapter 7, and eventually we want to consider where he, where he ended up. Now we can't make this an exhaustive study um, there is an enormous amount of the words, personal writings and words and thoughts and emotions that are expressed of the Apostle through all of his writings. Um, it, it's a, quite enormous. And um, in trying to explain how the approach was going to work with, with Brother Mark earlier today, I, I used an analogy which he said was a good one, so I'm going to repeat it now. It's kind of like if we stack the book of Acts and then all of the epistles in behind that, and then we took a skewer that has a subject title on it and we poked it, all the way through and then drew it back out, we would see all the tasty morsels that are there through all of the, all of the books and the epistles. And that's kind of what we need to do um, to do any form of justice to this subject because we have so much material. That will mean that the skewer will miss many of the quotations that might come to your mind um, that might fit our subject and w please bring them to me if, and let's talk about them because I would love to, uh, to be able to enrich my own understanding of this subject as well. Almost totally, um, in this study, we will be using words and descriptions of the Apostle himself. And we almost hardly all reach out from the book of Acts and the epistles. Uh, so hopefully in, in that way you can see what he has said about himself and what we can learn from him. So what sort of person was Saul? Now, I used to think... Um, perhaps it was a Sunday school view, and maybe you've had some of this view too yourself, um, that Saul was, was basically a decent sort of person following God, but in a misguided fashion. That what God needed to do, and we see this in the, in the Damascus Road conversion, was to get hold of a man who was facing in the wrong direction and just turn him in the way that he needed to go. He was already wound up. And just set him off in the right path. I don't think that anymore. To work out a person's character, their motivation, what we'd like to do particularly for the Apostle or for Saul tonight is to have a look at what we learn of his character and what we see of his actions to try to work out what he actually was and what he started out to be and try to understand their motives. Now I've got a bit of a diagram here on the screen which hopefully is going to help us think about this is that we can look at the actions of an individual person and we can look at the impact that those actions will have on others and that, that are around them but that doesn't necessarily tell us all that we need to know 
Because those actions are generally as a result of character. But the character of an individual is itself informed by a motivator, a motivation, a worldview, and the same is the case here. So in this model, we just want to have a look at and understand the motivation and the character that led to the actions and that had the impact of Saul in the first instance. And what we're going to do in the next probably 20 minutes um, is we're going to go skip, 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 skip through almost all of the writings of Paul. They're all going to be words that you're all 100% familiar with. But perhaps by stacking them solidly back to back and seeing them all that way, we might form for ourselves an enriched picture of what the apostle was like. And we're going to do that by looking at pieces of character and actions that we see. And in this exercise, you need to be quick with your Bible fingers because we're going to be going very quickly through around about 17 um, scriptures. All right, so everybody ready? You need to... Did it, was, it only, was it only my school that did finger exercises during assemblies? Did anybody else? It was? No one, anyone else did that? Okay, well, if you, if you weren't, then just practice your finger exercises because we've we got to get ready to kick off. And we're going to start here in Acts chapter 8. We will come back to chapter 7, uh, just at the, at the end of this little sequence, um, because we want to see some of the actions and impact that, that have come out there. But let's just start, start in Acts chapter 8 and verse 3. And we're going to go through multiple scriptures and pick out one or two key words that we can see from the actions or the descriptions of, of the apostle and give it a character statement. And what is the character that underpins that particular action? So Acts chapter 8 and verse 3 after the death of Stephen, as for Saul, he made havoc of the ecclesia, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. If I was going to put one word to describe what we learned there about the Apostle Paul's character that might have driven the actions that we just read there in chapter 8 and verse 3, it would be the word remorseless. Every single house, they say they've got the Gregory's UBD or the Gregory's or the UBD out and did it on a map to make sure that he didn't miss anybody. He remorselessly went into every single house and got out any that had relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's go to the next one, Acts chapter 9 and verse 1 and 2. Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Now Saul was probably well known in the city of Jerusalem, having been perhaps the chief of the students of Gamaliel of that place. But you didn't just waltz into the office of the high priest and demand letters of authority to go somewhere else and to have that authority to then bring people bound back to Jerusalem. You had to have a certain amount of influence. You had to go through the layers of the bureaucracy to be able to get to the high priest to have this kind of influence. And when we consider the subject of Paul as a persecutor tomorrow, or Saul as a persecutor tomorrow, we'll talk a little bit more about this. But what we're seeing here is we're seeing an aggressive man with his breathing out threatenings and slaughter, and a pushy person who wants to get into a space of influence to get the authority that he wants to take it off to Damascus. So we've got a few character words now. Remorseless, aggressive, and pushy. When we come a little bit further in Acts chapter 9 to verse 13 and 14, we have here the words of Ananias, who describes the expect what they understand about the about Saul and Ananias answered Lord I've heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to thy saints in Jerusalem and here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name how did Ananias know about that well no doubt Saul would have sent the messages ahead to the rulers of the synagogues in that place to say I'm coming uh, and if you're the rulers of the synagogue, you don't, want to, you don't want me to find you harboring members of this way in your synagogue. And I've got these letters of authority, dear rulers of the synagogue, so be prepared for that. And so he's happy to wave around the authoritarian banner 
of the power that he'd been given by the, um, by the high priest on his way to Damascus. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 21, we read of those that understood that he was coming. And what did they say about him? All that were in the synagogue when Paul initially preached there. I'm sorry, I'm going to get Saul and Paul interchanged the whole way through here. So if, if you can just, um, I'll apologise for that in advance. I'm not going to be able to say Saul when I need to and Paul. I think you know who I'm talking about. So all of those in verse 21 that heard that he had been converted were amazed and they said, isn't this he that destroyed them, which called on his name, on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? And you remember that it was going to be women and men. It was totally unfeeling of their personal situations or their family environment. The women and men have occurred in the previous two verses that we've looked at as well. And so here, here, were the, here were the disciples that were, or the Jews that were amazed that, that this was that man. This is what he was going to come to do. And so he had no feeling at all uh, or concern for those that he was going to take bound unto the chief priests, knowing what was going to happen to them there, because he had already arranged for the death of Stephen. In Acts chapter 9, verse 26, just as an aside, you can see how much of an impact Saul had had, because in verse 26... When he came back converted, he tried to join to the disciples, but they were all terrified of him, absolutely afraid. They could not believe that he had become a disciple because they had seen his remorseless, aggressive, pushy, authoritarian, unfeeling character on display already uh, at this time. When we come forward to Acts chapter 22 and verses 3 to 5, we find Paul talking about, after his conversion, talking about what he was like and how he treated the ecclesia before he was converted. He's talking here uh, to the Jewish people. He says in verses 3 to 5, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. All right, absolute clarity in his mission as to what he was going to be able to do. He had a great zealousness towards God, Perhaps the most positive of the words that we've seen at the present time, to, to the present time. But he was absolutely judgmental. It was black and white for him. And if you were following after this way, that was black. And I was bringing you back to Jerusalem to punish you. And later in that chapter, in verse 19 to 20, as he, as he continues to speak, he speaks, he reminds, he, he remembers what he had said to the Lord. Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat, right, he's hands on here, he, I beat in every synagogue them that believed in thee. And when the blood of thy witness, martyr Stephen, was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. If we wanted to find one word to describe what we learn of the character of Paul out of these actions, I'm suggesting the word relentless. It's just continuously going to go after these believers. In chapter 23 and verse 6, when he speaks before the council, he continues to give a description of who he was. And when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. Now you might know that the word Pharisee has the idea of a separated one. Somebody who felt themselves to be distinct because of their righteousness under the law from the normal people. To call himself a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, helps us understand that he saw value in the pedigree and the family line that he had come down. Because he had, if, if, if you like, he had followed the path of being a Pharisee from his father and from perhaps those that were before. In Acts chapter 26, when he's talking before the Roman rulers, and in verse 9 to 11, 
He tells us what was going on inside his mind while all of these things were happening and visible to the outside. Acts 26 and verse 9. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which things I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, not just Stephen, when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Not just Damascus, but other cities as well that he was um, chasing them down. We we learn a lot of things here in Paul's expression here of, of what he was like. He was contrary. He was unremitting because he punished them oft. He was blasphemous. In fact, worse than that, he was unforgiving because he compelled them to blaspheme and then still threw them in prison and beat them and put them to death. He made them recant and still locked them up. The idea here of being exceedingly mad is one of uncontrolled anger, a superabundant rage, or to even just be almost spitting with rage at somebody, to be raving at them because of their Uh, belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we don't just stop in Acts. We get all of the descriptions through the epistles. So we're going to keep going. So if your fingers are ready, let's keep going into Romans chapter 10, uh, where the Apostle Paul continues to talk about what sort of person he had been. In verses 1 to 3, he tells of the group of Jewish, of of the Jewish religion, that he had been amongst, and obviously he had these same characteristics. Romans 10, verse 1 to 3. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And from this, we can learn that Paul himself would have been in that class and we can describe him as self-righteous. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 9, we learn some more. He says, I am the last that the Lord appeared to after his resurrection, and I am the least of the apostles. In fact, I'm not even feeling that I'm meant to be called an apostle because I persecuted the ecclesia of God. It means to pursue them, as we've seen in Acts chapter 9, an unremitting chase after those that believed in the Lord. In the second of Corinthians, chapter 4 and verse 2, the Apostle Paul says, well, in verse 1, I have received this ministry to preach, and here's what the change was required of me. I had to renounce the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, no longer handling the word of God deceitfully, but instead manifesting the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. The word for hidden here in another translation has underhanded. There was a means that was justified because of the ends. He was dishonest or crafty, as another translation has and deceitfully handling the word of God. These are telling us some of his characteristics. In the 11th chapter of the 2nd of Corinthians, chapter 11 uh, and verse 22, talking about the false apostles that were coming to be an influence in the ecclesia and letting them understand that he had as many things to boast about as they could. Uh, Verse 22, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. I don't want to talk like this, he says in verse 23. I speak as a fool. I feel embarrassed putting up these credentials. But this is the way that they think is important, and I did when I was there. I was a Hebrew. I did separate myself, a bit like what the word Pharisee means. Yes, I am an Israelite. Actually, not just an Israelite. I can trace my genealogy. I'm the seed of Abraham. I can check that I actually did 
um, um, follow down from Abrahamic descent. I wasn't, wasn't just of a family that married in. I can trace my pedigree all the way back. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 13. You've heard of my conversation, my way of life in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the ecclesia of God and wasted it. And I profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. In Galatians chapter 1, he tells us that he exceeded in his teachings, in, in what he had learned uh, from Gamaliel. In fact, to some extent, he was a bit unbending because Gamaliel gave the advice, if you remember, to leave the brotherhood alone and see whether it came of God. And despite the fact that his mentor had given that advice, he still went on in his own way to persecute them. He beyond measure persecuted and wasted them, has the idea of being excessive so that anybody watching on would have thought that's way beyond what was necessary. He was a rigid traditionalist and proud of having profited and, and got straight A's in his class with Gamaliel. Philippians chapter 3 uh, and verse 4 to 6. Just a couple more. Philippians 3 verse 4 to 6. Look, I've got plenty of things to be confident about in the flesh if we're getting down to a scorecard, the apostle says. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath, hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I've got more. I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the ecclesia. And touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Nobody could lay a finger on me. How would we read Philippians 3 verse 4 to 6? Self-confident. Racist. Not just a separated Hebrew from all of those Gentiles, but a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Because some of those Hebrews even aren't quite good enough. Separated again inside that community. Elitist. Remember he said in another place, I was free born, as he said to the Roman soldier. He, bl he was blameless. He thought himself perfect. And the ultimate role model insofar as fulfilling the law of God. First Timothy chapter 1. Just a few more over. And verse 13. I was before a blasphemer, we've already had that one, and a persecutor, we've had that, and injurious, strong means an insulter, somebody who speaks spitefully about others, a maltreater. And just over a few more pages in Titus 3 and verse 3, we were ourselves also sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. And another translation reads, we used to be stupid, dishonest, foolish, slaves of all sorts of desires and pleasures. We were evil and jealous. Everyone hated us and we hated everyone. None of those words probably new to us. But by putting them all together like that, I hope we can see where the apostle was before he was an apostle and how he was back in Acts chapter 7. And let's just put all those words that we've summarized up on the screen so that we can see them in all their ugliness together. Remorseless, aggressive, pushy, authoritarian, unfeeling, zealous, judgmental, relentless, pedigreed, contrary, blasphemous, unforgiving, rage-filled, self-righteous, unremitting, underhanded, dishonest, crafty, deceitful, unbending, excessive, a rigid traditionalist, proud, self-confident, racist, elitist, perfect according to the law and his own opinion, spiteful, stupid, disobedient, foolish, a slave of all sorts of desires and pleasures, evil, jealous, everyone hated us, we hated you everyone that's the character 
from which we read of Acts chapter 7 and 8 and 9 and the persecution that the, that the apostle brought into play. What motivated that character? What was the underlying thought pattern that made Saul and potentially many of the other Pharisees like this? Well, I'd like to propose that if we just drop back to Galatians, which we just flipped through a minute ago, that the apostle in the repetition of a particular phrase gives us the answer. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul says this. He's been informed now of the truth of the matter, but he reveals to us the thinking of his sect. Knowing now that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. Third time now, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And so I think, brothers and sisters, we can summarise that the motivation of the way that we work before God, if it comes from a justification by works of the law, then the perfection of the completion of that law that the apostle was able to boast of enabled him to hide a multitude of his character flaws because he could be justified by the works of the law in which he was, if you remember, blameless. And yet all of these characteristics were there underneath. So this is the motivation of what motivates uh, somebody and what results in character by having the wrong understanding of our actual position before God. So we'll just leave that there and it'll just be something for us to let it seep into our minds and just think about that. And on another occasion, we'll put up an alternate picture as to what the apostle became and what the change of his motivation was that enabled a change in that character. But character leads into the way that we live and the actions that we take. And tonight's study is around Saul as a Pharisee. So we should learn a little bit more about the Pharisees and particularly what we learn in Scripture about them. There are four insightful stories uh, in, uh, in, in the Gospels that tell us a little bit about the Pharisees. We're just going to quickly go through those. You will see them echoed again in the following four studies uh, because where the Apostle Paul got to was far removed from what we see about how Pharisees work. We won't look at this, but Acts 26 and verse 5, the Apostle Paul says that after the straightest sect of their religion, he lived a Pharisee. So it wasn't just that he had the label and the title, he lived a Pharisee. So let's see how the Pharisees lived and what we can learn from them. First of all, let's come back to Luke chapter 7 and verse 36 to 39. Luke 7 and verse 36 to 39. It's the story of a feast or a meal that the Lord Jesus Christ was invited to uh, with Pharisees. Luke 7 verse 36 to 39. I'm sorry, I've got the wrong one, I think. No, this is the one. One of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house. And sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, you see the repetition? We've had the word Pharisee three times already in the story. So it's very clearly this is about how does the Pharisees live. When the woman knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, 
would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him because she's a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I've somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. You see, we, we knew along, all along what the name of this person was. It was Simon. But we've been told this is how Pharisee lives. Right, that's why they're for repetition. Simon, there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The man owed, the one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them loved him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, thou hast rightly judged. He turned to the woman, but he said to Simon, seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint. These are common hospitality actions. Simon didn't do any of them. But this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, and you know because you called her a sinner, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And the whole multitude of the people that were gathered there rejoiced at the fact that the Lord was able to forgive sins. Uh, no, they didn't, because they were all Pharisees too. Verse 49, And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that's forgiving sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee, go in peace. What do we learn about the life, lives of the Pharisee from this man's attitude? There was no love. There was no forgiveness possible. There was a very judgmental spirit that would have meant that this woman would have never been welcome uh, in this Pharisee's house, no matter how interested she was in the ways of God. No love, no forgiveness, just pure judgment. That's one of the stories that we learn about the Pharisees. Let's look at Luke chapter 11 and see the next one. Not so many verses in this story, but still quite insightful. Luke chapter 11 and verse 37 to 38. As he spake, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him. And he went in and sat down to meet. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. This is a disgusting behaviour, not having washed hands before dinner. We won't continue on through the story there. But the Lord is going to tell them that their focus on ritual and not on thankfulness and generosity meant that they were full of ravening wickedness. They were totally self-consumed in their own rigidity. And that was going to mean that they couldn't bring anything of value to the people. In Luke chapter 18, we have another Pharisee mentioned. And we know this story very well. Uh, this is the parable of, of those that went to pray. Luke chapter 18, verse 10 to 11. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican, the other half of the evil twins, according to the Pharisees, of the publicans and the sinners. Remember always those labels the Pharisees were putting on people? The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not even like this publican. Oh, I fast twice in the week. I'm justified by the works of the law. Very self-focused, this Pharisee. His prayer was about himself, self-righteous, who elevated himself and looked down on others. And the final one in John chapter 7 um, is about, again, how the Pharisee saw the common people. John chapter 7, verse 47 the officers had been sent to take Jesus. They'd been unable to because they were amazed at the things that he said. Where, where, where is he? We told you to arrest him. Oh, never man spake like this man. And then answered them the Pharisees, verse 47. Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? 
But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Absolute despising of the people who don't know the law. Whose job was it to teach them the law? If the Pharisees were proud of their ability to understand it and to pass it on, whose job was that? That they had despised the people. They were self-righteous and disdainful of others and they were not going to do that. So if we add the characteristics that we've learned there from the four ways that the Pharisees are described as living, remember, Saul lived a Pharisee, if we add those characteristics to the bottom of the chart that we already had, we would say that there is no love, no forgiveness, judgmental, self-consumed, self-focused and self-righteous. Saul wasn't merely a misguided zealot. He was a self-righteous rotter. And it took about 13 years for him to work on that character enough before he could be sent out as an apostle on any missionary journeys. After his conversion, three years he spent in Arabia. We like to think that he went down to Mount Sinai. That was a place where Moses was sent for 40 years to get his character in order before he could fulfill the work of God. That was a place that Elijah went to get a character alignment before he could go back and start to build up the 7,000 that had not yet bowed the knee to Baal. Three years Saul was in Arabia and then possibly 10 more back in Tarsus working quietly with a local ecclesia that was in that place. Because a Damascus Road conversion is no more a character transplant than our own baptisms. And there's deliberate work that has to be done for us to identify all of the threads of the old man and to start to snip them off and cut the knots and pull them out painfully, as we all know, before that he can fulfil the work of God. So our first picture that we had on the screen showed the Pharisee a bit like this. Um, For the purpose of understanding where Paul started from, let's change the picture. I think it's much more like that, was what the Apostle Paul was like. So that we can, and it's important for us to consider that because we need to understand the scale of the transformation that actually had to happen. It was enormous. The character leads into actions. Let's just go back to Acts chapter 6 and see where that character led. In fact, we don't need to turn it. I've got it on the screen. The Cilician synagogues, amongst whom counted their number, the Apostle Paul, it says that they suborned men. Uh, They made deals with them to tell lies. There's no point polishing it. And they stirred up the people so that there would be a lot of energy. And they set up false witnesses that ended up leading to Stephen's downfall. And the witnesses, before picking up their stones, laid their clothes down at the feet of a young man, at the feet of a young man whose name was Saul. And I think the scripture is telling us that the they in that first clause included Saul. He was up to his neck in the destruction of Stephen. In Acts chapter 7, which we had read, uh, or the the end of Acts chapter 7, uh, we had read just a little while ago, have a look at verse 58. These people cast out Stephen from the city, stoned him. They laid their clothes down at at, at Saul's feet. And then verse 1 of chapter 8, and Saul was consenting unto his death. And that kind of makes it sound like when they did the vote across the Sanhedrin or if Saul was there as part of the witnesses, that he consented. When they said, all those in favour say I, his voice was there amongst the eyes. But it's not really what the word consenting means. The only other time in scripture that that word occurs is at the end of Romans chapter 1. Where after a big litany of the sins of the Gentiles, the Apostle Paul says, and not only that, not only are there all those people that complete these sins, there's another category of those that take pleasure 
in those that do them. That's exactly the same word here. So it wasn't just consenting. He didn't just give his vote. He was taking pleasure in the fact that Stephen was being killed. This is the motivation and the character and the actions and the impact that Saul had before his conversion. How do you convert a man like that? Can you imagine this racist man saying that there's neither Jew nor Greek? This elitist man saying that there's not bond or free. This Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, saying while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Can you imagine this proud, rigid traditionalist Acknowledging that the restrictions of the law, touch not, taste not, handle not, were all to be done away. And who would castigate Peter for withdrawing from eating with Gentiles when he wouldn't have been said dead eating with them before. Can you imagine this Hebrew of the Hebrews, Gentile hater, preaching salvation to them through faith, hope and love? And can we imagine this unforgiving man telling us that the greatest of those three is love? How do you convert a man like that? He had to be convinced of error, this blameless man. He had to be convinced that he was an enemy of God, not zealous of the law. He had to be convinced to put off the old man in its entirety. And he had to be convinced that he was a wretched sinner who deserved the wages of death. And it was only because of an undeserved gift of God that eternal life could come. And it was never going to be by fulfilling works of the law. Tomorrow we're going to have a look at how the Lord was able to convert him and set him on a course to be the preeminent witness of Christ to the uttermost parts of the earth and all the way down to our time. But if our study is to be about change and transformation, did Paul get it? Did he understand the need for that change and transformation that was going to come? I've got another 15 quotes for us, um, but I'm going to put them on the screen this time because your fingers are probably getting tired out now, right? So let's... um, Let's think about some of these and move on from Saul as a Pharisee and take on this idea of putting on the new man. Now, hopefully that's big enough for you to read. I've got uh, the writings of Paul and I've unapologetically put Hebrews down the bottom. Not everyone will have the view that Hebrews was written by Paul, but I believe it was. So um, that would be an interesting discussion for us to have uh, at another time, uh, as in not right now. Um, But I'm going to put that there because I think it'll be it'll be helpful for us. But let's skip through again, but quickly on the screen, to see what was a primary message of the Apostle in every book that he wrote. Let's start with Romans, chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. We know this one. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Changed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now we're going to skip most of these without much commentary, but I think and I hope that you can see the weight of what's behind the repetition. In First of Corinthians 13, verse 11, he puts the growth and the learning in the perspective of children growing to men. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man. When I grew, when I changed, as I'm transforming, I put away childish things. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You can hear the transformation and change requirements that he understood. Galatians 6 verse 14 to 15. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, the law doesn't avail anything, neither uncircumcision, 
But you've got to transform. You've got to become a new creature. That's what matters uh, as we come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4, verse 21 to 23. If you've heard him and have been taught by him, so you've learned some new thing, as the truth is in Jesus, well, what you've got to do is you've got to put off concerning your former way of life, the old man. Because the old man is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. And I know about that because that was me. And you need to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. There's got to be a transformation that comes because of the word that you have been taught uh, by our God. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. I'm confident of this thing, he said to the Philippian Ecclesia, which he loved, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it. It's not finished just because you're baptised. There's a continuation of that work and a continuation of growth and transformation that is required. Colossians 3, verse 9 to 10. Don't lie to one another, seeing you've put off the old man with his deeds. That was before. You're transforming to something new. Put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. And we want you to grow more and more towards the picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. A couple from 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 12. I want the Lord to make you increase and abound in love one toward another. That's not a static picture of love, is it? It's a growing one. It's going to get bigger and bigger. And he says in the next chapter 4, verse 1 at the end, so I want you to abound more and more. There's no sitting still. It's always continuous, a transformation. And we, as you have received of us, how you ought to walk. This is my example now that I'm asking you to follow. 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet. Because, as I hoped for in the last epistle, now I'm going to write and confirm, I see that your faith is growing exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19 to 20. Even in situations of discipline, it's for the purpose of someone to learn so that they might grow and hopefully return. In the book of Titus 3, verse 14. Let all of ours also learn to maintain good works. It's going to be a continuous growth that's going on here with the concept of fruitfulness, which comes from trees. And you can see the growth concept that's coming there. Philemon, practically, well, there was an Isthmus that in time past was unprofitable, but now he's profitable to thee and to me. There's been a transformation, Philemon. And I want you to accept and acknowledge that. And in Hebrews chapter 13, Verse 20 to 21, in the prayer that he concludes the book with, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect. And in case anybody thinks that they got there and had been perfect, he makes sure that it's clear, no, he wants us perfect in every good work to do his will because God continues to work in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So you can see throughout the writings, if we take that skewer analogy again, poked it all the way through the epistles and see where that transformation idea comes through. It's a repeated theme all the way through uh, the writings of the, Lord Je of the Apostle Paul. Let's put a couple of summary points back up here. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. We all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory. Thank you. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We're changed. And it's an ever-increasing amount of our Lord Jesus Christ becoming evident in us from glory to glory. It's growing all the time as we're influenced by the Spirit of the Lord. And that will eventually lead to our salvation in Philippians 3 because he's going to transform our vile body to be fashioned like his. A continuous character development is the story that the Apostle Paul is demonstrating for us here in that continuous transformation. Now, did anybody notice that I missed out one of the books of Paul? What, hand? Oh, nobody noticed. Um, we missed out the second Timothy as we went through. I was deliberate, just in case you thought it was a mistake. Um, we, we've left it to the end because I think there's another little point that we can raise in here. 2 Timothy 4 verse 11, we have a very personal story related, related to personal growth. 
that the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, sorry, that the Apostle Paul uh, was related to. You see, not only do we have to change, and not only should we expect change in ourselves, and not only should we expect change in others, we should acknowledge that it happens. I'm not the same person that I was 30 years ago. The second Timothy 4 Paul was not the same as he was in Acts chapter 9 after his conversion and definitely not the same as in Acts chapter 7 as we have been considering. And here is the story of another brother, Mark. You'll remember, we won't look at it in detail, but it's there on the screen, Acts chapter 15 and verse 37. Perhaps take the middle, the middle paragraph there. Paul thought not good to take Mark with him because he departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. Mark had grown. There'd been a change and a transformation. And the apostle was willing to recognise it. We don't freeze ourselves in the past, brothers and sisters, do we? We shouldn't freeze our brothers and sisters into their pasts either. We should acknowledge and celebrate the growth that we see amongst all of us because it is evidence of the work of God. Actually, you know, I think I've misquoted that Second Timothy 4 passage too. Um, let's put the other words back in. Mark is profitable to me for the ministry. Not only had Mark changed, I think the apostle recognised he had changed too. And those who were going to be able to work with him he was going to be able to work with them, even though he may in the past have had a difference of opinion. Not only do we have to change, but we have to accept and acknowledge that change is occurring and that it is the work of God and acknowledge that it also occurs in our brothers and sisters. Let's conclude by having a look at Philippians and chapter 3. And from verse 7 to 9. You know, we already read verse 4 to 6. And saw what Paul was like before. And we know the end of the story because we've already read all of the epistles. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. What things were gained to me in my old man state? Let's put him back up on the screen so we can remember what he was like. Those things that were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss. Every part of the old man was a worthless waste compared to the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And I count them all dung because I need to be a new man to win Christ. And I want to be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. We've got that phrase again. But that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Saul may have lived as a Pharisee. In all the deceitful lusts of self-delusion and self-aggrandisement and self-righteousness that we've already seen. But we know at the end he counted all of those parts of his original self as worthless so that he could win Christ. He never thought he'd actually get there. He knew it was a continual journey. You see he carries on in verse 12. Not as though I had already attained, neither were already perfect. The transformation has to continue. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that which also I am apprehended of Jesus Christ. Yes, the Lord reached down and grabbed that man. And yes, he turned him in another direction. And he had to rework his total self to be able to fulfill the work of God in that transformation. Brethren, verse 13, I, have not, I don't count myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind and I reach forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God 
in Christ Jesus. Look at how much he valued the fact that God had reached into his life and demanded that transformation so that he may be able to reach unto that prize. He never considered that he'd reached any perfection. He had not reached any maturity and neither will we. We, all of us, have to continue to reach forward, to learn more, to press onwards, to grow into the image of God's Son. And if we do that, brothers and sisters, then we will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, into his glorious image in immortality. We'll come to remember our Lord tomorrow.